Today we are continuing in our series called Frequently Asked Questions, where we're looking at some of the top questions that we often find getting asked about God and our faith. Our theme verse is printed in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull that out as we read it together. This comes from the seventh chapter of Matthew, verse 7, and it is the reason that we are doing this entire series. Join with me. Ask and you will receive. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. This is one of my favorite things about the way we understand God, is that we understand God to not be cryptic, always, but to be open to questions, to want us to explore our faith, to not just take everything we see or hear at face value, but to dig deeper and deeper into it. And so we're asking some of these big questions about God here in the month of January. Last week we talked about, does God really love everyone? Looking at the story of the three wise men and how Christ came not just for the Hebrew people, but for everyone in the whole world, and how strange that was at the time. Today we're talking about, what does it mean to be a Christian? Next week we're going to talk about miracles. Are miracles real, and what do we do with them? And we're going to close out with everyone's favorite topic, what happens when we die? So we're trying to hit some of the big ones, and today it's a question that I feel like gets asked, maybe not directly, but implied a lot of the time. What does it mean to be a Christian? Why do we have so many different churches who say we have to do different things or believe different things? What does it mean to be a Christian? This question gets asked a lot in Scripture. And so I want to read a text from James that helps us to understand a key piece of this. This is the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. You must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their faces in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. But there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget. They put it into practice in their lives. They will be blessed in whatever they do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, we're asking some big questions. And we know that you're not going to part the clouds and give us the answer through a big booming voice. We know that's not typically how you work. So help us to understand today the words of James. Help us to begin to ask these questions. What does it really mean to be a Christian? And how does that relate to my life? God, speak to us and we will listen. We are trusting you. We are trying to follow and be disciples. So help us to understand how to do that day by day. In your name we pray. Amen. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, before we get into all of that, I want to make a quick point to say today we're not talking about salvation and grace. Those are free gifts. You can't do anything to earn those things. We can't earn salvation. God's grace is a free gift offered to all without price. So that's not what we're talking about today. That's just a given. It's a gift that we all get. Grace is free. We can't earn God's love or God's forgiveness or eternal life. It's a gift given to us. Today, we're talking about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ. What does discipleship look like? We receive grace that is free, but then what? That's the question we're looking at today. Then what? The first thing to know about this is there's a big difference between believing in God and following God. There's a difference between theology and discipleship, what we believe and how we live. And that distinction really matters because we can get obsessed with reading theology and listening to podcasts and reading books and learning how to interpret scripture and arguing with people on Facebook and winning those arguments and losing and trying to develop our perfect theology. Churches have split over theology thousands of times throughout our history. We can spend a lot of time trying to get very clear about what we believe and how do we interpret scripture. And yet, even though we do all that work and know all that theology, sometimes our lives don't actually produce any fruit. I heard a really, really great analogy about this on a podcast that I was listening to this week. And the host said, it's like the difference between knowing a recipe and being able to cook. Because those are two separate things. 
You can memorize a bunch of recipes. You can study cooking techniques. You can know intellectually how to do everything in the kitchen. But if you've never actually been in a kitchen in front of a stove and tried to do that, we would all say, you don't know how to cook. Those are two very different things. And I know that because I have tried some new techniques this year, and they have not gone well. I tried to poach an egg. That was a disaster. I've tried multiple different ways of cooking steak. I've burned a lot of them. It's so different. You can see someone do it, and you're like, oh, that's easy. You just, you know, wait till it's done, and you flip it. Why is mine sticking to the pan? It didn't stick to his pan. I don't understand. Actually getting in the kitchen and doing it is so different than just reading about it. But we do have to know the recipe. We do have to know the cooking technique. If we include the wrong ingredients, it's not going to turn out right. But actually executing that recipe correctly is the hardest part, and that's what takes practice. So our doctrine and our theology, what we believe, absolutely matters. But just because we know a lot about God doesn't mean we have that deep spiritual life or that we are living our faith out to help God transform the world. Now, I realized as I was writing this sermon that I've talked about this a lot in the last six months. There were a few lines that I wrote when I was like, that sounds really familiar. Where did I hear that before? It was me. I said it like three weeks ago. And I was like, am I preaching the same scripture? Am I preaching the same sermon? Why do I keep coming back to this? And I realized that it's something that I've come back to multiple times because deepening our faith and following Christ is something we have to continue to do all the time. We have to keep working at it. And in a lot of ways, I'm just preaching to myself because I need to be reminded of these things. And I thought, well, if I do, I don't know, maybe somebody else does too. We usually have to remind ourselves of these things over and over and over again. Last weekend, I led an event where I was helping a lot of candidates who want to become United Methodist pastors prepare for the biggest interview they have. And it's massive. It's three separate 45-minute interviews. They had to write a 30-page theology paper, record sermons, all these things. It's what Rick, who's preached a couple times this year, is about to do. He's one of those 18 candidates. And I sat there with him, and this was the fourth time I'd met with him over the last year, preparing him for these interviews. And I realized in the last day that everything I was going to say, I had already told him three times before. And so I started the day off, and I said, okay, you're not going to hear anything new today. Everything I'm going to say is going to be a repeat. And somebody raised their hand, and they said, do we have to stay? <laughs> and I said, A, this isn't required. B, it was free. And C, you don't get your free lunch if you leave. So yes, you have to stay. But I was saying the same thing over and over and over again, but I was reminded in that moment that that's the whole point. Every good teacher I've had, every good coach I've ever had usually says the same things over and over and over and over and over and over again. The number of times that I heard my coach in high school say, Williams, if you touch the ball, you should have caught the ball. I thought, but coach, it was, it's cold and it was far away and, you know, I can't do it. If you touch the ball, you should have caught. The number of times that I heard that, the number of times that I was out learning how to golf with my father, and he said, keep your head down, keep your eye on the ball. I was like, but I want to see where it goes. <laughs> right, but you got to hit it first, right? But when I hit it, I want to see where it goes. The same thing over and over and over and over again. That repetition is good because what we need to do doesn't change. It ebbs and flows. The different spiritual practices we take on might vary over time, but we always have to spend time with God. We always have to work on our faith. And that's hard for us to maintain because it doesn't work like a lot of things in our life today. There's no off-season for our faith, and we can't microwave it. And that's how we experience a lot of things in life. We're used to things coming in seasons. We have a busy season at work, and then we have a light season at work. Sports have seasons and off-seasons where you take time off and you rest and you recover and you get away from it all. Schools have semesters and breaks. We're used to having those seasons, those times where we can kind of forget about something for a while and then come back to it. But deepening our personal faith and putting that into action to love and serve others is something we do each and every day. It's like if you've ever learned a different language. If you stop using that language, you lose it. And it's remarkable how fast you forget those words and you forget how that grammar works. Your brain doesn't hold on to that information for very long. The number of people that I know who are like me who took Spanish in high school and know like six words today. <laughs> I took three or four years of Spanish in high school. 
I don't remember any of it because I don't ever use it. And our faith is the same way. There is no off-season. And we also can't microwave our discipleship. It's a lifelong journey. And that's hard for us because we like to microwave everything. Everything is instant. We need instant rice because we can't wait 10 minutes for regular rice. We need instant oatmeal because we can't wait three minutes for regular oatmeal. Everything is instant. We need next day delivery, streaming on demand. I'll tell you, I do so much streaming that when I was watching the playoff football games and they go to commercial break every five seconds, it's like they're about to kick off commercial. They kicked off commercial. All right, they got the ball. Time out. I was like, I've seen more commercials than I've seen plays. What's happening? And it felt so lopsided because I'm so used to living in a commercial-free world. I remember my kids, we were talking about uh, Christmas was coming up, and we were asking our kids, like, what do you want? What are you going to ask Santa? What do you want for Christmas? And they had no, they had nothing. They had nothing to ask for. They didn't know what they wanted. And Emma and I were so confused. We said, how, how does a six-year-old not know what he wants for Christmas? How does a four-year-old not know what they want for Christmas? And we realized they never see commercials. They don't know what exists in the world. They don't even know what toys are out there to want. This is a beautiful setup for parents. <laughs> they don't even know what they want. They're not asking for the new hot toy because they literally don't know what exists. It's beautiful. <laughs> there is no off season. We can't microwave it. It's a lifelong journey. We love to microwave things. We have such a short attention span, even for doing God's work. When disaster strikes in our world, we're pretty good, both as a church and as just human beings, in responding really quickly. News hits, shows us these horrible pictures of disaster, and there'll be a telethon, or there'll be a GoFundMe, or there'll be something that pops up, and we respond right away. We're pretty good about that. When the fires in Maui happened in August, the world responded in a huge way. Around the world, love, support, prayers, and resources flooded the Hawaiian Islands. But if you're honest, you probably haven't thought much about those fires since that happened. But 2,200 buildings were destroyed. $5.5 billion in damage were done to the Hawaiian Islands. That's not rebuilt yet. That's not going to be rebuilt next year or in five years. It's going to take probably decades to recover from something like that. And some never will. But the world moved on. We moved on to the next thing. And this is one of my favorite things about being a Methodist, because Methodists are methodical. There's a reason we're called Methodists. One of my favorite stories about Methodism is that we're called Methodists, which started out as a joke. People were making fun of us. So when John and Charles Wesley were first meeting, they had a process to everything. They were super methodical, and people started to make fun of this new growing movement. And they were like, ugh, you guys have a process for everything. You do everything so slowly, you're just, you're, you're Methodist. You have a method for everything. And they were making fun of them. And John Wesley was like, I kind of like that name. So that's where our name came from. It was making fun of us. But we're Methodists. We're methodical. We're slow. We take our time, but we don't give up. UMCOR is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. They do missional outreach and disaster relief all over the world. And in 2022, UMCOR and Global Ministries worked in more than 110 countries, approving grants totaling $52 million. In one year, $52 million in disaster relief and ministry around the world. Our church pays into this every year through our apportionments. It's one of the things that we do to support our global denomination, and a big part of that is disaster relief and outreach around the world. UMCOR is known for not necessarily being the first ones to respond to a disaster, but they're almost always the last ones to leave. They're there, and they stay there, and they continue to support long after the disaster has struck. There's a couple of examples that uh, have really been so impactful to me. One is from our conference here in North Texas. Two years ago, a very powerful tornado ripped through Jacksboro County. Um, Jack County is about 60 miles northwest of Fort Worth and it caused over two million dollars of damage. It just ripped up the small town of Jacksboro. And our conference, our North Texas conference, made a commitment to raise a quarter of that relief aid, $500,000, and to make a five-year commitment to be in Jack County, not only to provide rebuilding assistance, but other services like legal assistance when you have to fire, file insurance claims. When an entire town gets hit by a tornado, the insurance companies become a lot less friendly because they have to pay out claims for an entire town. 
and so you need a lot of legal representation. So they provided that to help with insurance claims, employment, so many things. It's been two years since that tornado hit, but the Methodists are still there. There's a project in Louisiana called the Epworth Project. It's United Methodist Missions Organization located in Slidell, Louisiana. It's just outside of New Orleans. Um, it's across the bridge from on Lake Pontchartrain, which I'm very happy that I learned how to pronounce that. My Louisiana in-laws were very proud that I could pronounce Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, but they were founded as the faith-based, volunteer-driven component of the local disaster response to Hurricane Katrina. Since 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit, this Epworth Project partnership has hosted more than 64,000 volunteers from all 50 states and 43 countries around the world, providing services for 3,400 families and logging nearly 2.8 million labor hours of community service. This is such a cool project. I took a youth group there about 10 years ago, and we pulled in a slide L, and I didn't know, because the youth director organized a trip, and I just went as one of the pastors, and he said, we're going to be doing work in New Orleans, and that's all I really knew about it. And I got there, and there were all these hurricane pictures on the wall, and I thought, what is this? And they were like, oh, this is Katrina relief. That's what Epworth does. And I thought, Katrina relief? Katrina was 10 years ago. Like, how is there still any work to do? And that was the obvious question everybody had, which was really, really embarrassing when the leaders started to talk to us about that. Thousands and thousands of people were still displaced. I worked in a home that had been uninhabitable for 10 years from Hurricane Katrina. That family had been displaced for 10 years. They still owned the property, but it wasn't worth anything in its current condition. And they had been working on it, trying to get two homes like this. 2.8 million labor hours. Katrina hit 19 years ago, and the Methodists are still there, still doing Katrina work, still doing that support and that rescue. And I think that's what James calls all of us to do. God transforms the world, but it takes time. And we're often too impatient to see that transformation happen in the world or even in our own lives. James calls us to be like those who study the law and continue to do it. I think that's the most important part of this, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget. They put it into practice in their lives. And that brings me to my final point, and that is that God shows us how to do this. God gives us rituals to follow. God gives us instructions. Scripture is full of explanations about what it means to be a Christian. Here's a few things that Scripture says about what it means to be a Christian. Micah 6.8 famously says, What does the Lord require? To do justice to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Matthew 22 is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 28 is the great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything that you have learned. Romans 12 gives the marks of a true Christian, and it talks about loving one another and living together in harmony. Scripture tells us that we should be more like Jesus, 1 John says, walk in the same way that Christ walked. 1 Peter says, Christ left you an example so that you might follow in his steps. 1 Corinthians says, be imitators of Christ. And Ephesians 5 says, be imitators of God as beloved children. Over and over again, we see that all of these things in Scripture have two things in common. One, they're all imperatives. They're all things that compel us to do something, do justice, Walk humbly with God, love one another and live in harmony, follow Christ's example, go and make disciples. They're all imperatives that compel us to action. None of them are a list of beliefs. None of them say, what does it mean to be a Christian? You must believe X, Y, and Z. You must hold these doctrinal tenets. You must memorize the Torah. It didn't have any of that in there. It was always things that we were to do. And the second thing is they all imply that we know Christ. We have to know the recipe and get in the kitchen. We have to love God and our neighbor. It takes both. Friends, God will save our lives. God offers us abundant life here on earth and eternal life forever in the kingdom of God. And God can and does change the world through each and every one of us. But we have to be Christians and not just call ourselves Christians. And that's hard work. So one of the blessings that God gave us were these rituals and these sacraments, things that we can do together. Because one of the hardest parts of this is, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I love God and love neighbor? Do I literally walk over to my neighbor's house and say, hey, I love you? 
that's probably not a good idea, right? How is your neighbor going to interpret that when they see that? You, you love me. How? Why? What does this mean? What are you about to ask for? That's a weird thing to say to someone. How do we go about doing this? So Christ gave us this starting point. Gather together and worship and do these things. And these sacraments are some of the most important things that we do together to remind us that faith is more than just belief. It's something that we live out. It's something real. It's something that connects us together. In just a minute, we're going to celebrate and renew our baptism here this morning. And we do this because we are all called from the waters of baptism to go and change the world. Each and every one of us, no matter what you do for a living, everyone is called into ministry to change the world. So when you come forward today... And when you touch this water, this water that unites us and connects us, this water that represents the same water Christ was baptized into, that generations for thousands of years Christians have been baptized into, that you and your children were baptized into, when you touch that living water, remember that you are a child of God and you are a blessing, that grace is free, that God's love is abundant and eternal, offered to you without cost. And when we put that faith into action, we can move mountains, and we can change the world. And that's what I think it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. God, help us to love you, to walk in the way that leads to life, to put our faith into practice. We focus so much on what we believe, the words that we use, who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong. How do we do baptism? How many sacraments are there? What are the rules? God, we have so much focus on these things, and they matter. What we believe and what we say matter. But faith without works is dead, and we know that you call us to more than just belief. You left us a legacy all throughout Scripture of women and men who put their faith into practice and changed the world. Sometimes it was in huge, life-changing, life-threatening ways. And sometimes it was in small, simple acts of kindness and love. So, Lord, may we follow those examples. May we be Christians. May we put our faith into practice. And as we come forward today to touch this living water, may our spirit be renewed so that we have that grace living within each and every one of us to go and be the disciples that you have called us to be. We love you and we trust you, O Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.